Thank you, praise team. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop. You never stop working. That's an amazing God we serve. Yeah. Amazing. Ah, I almost ran up and down the aisle like I was in the Church of God in Christ. <laughs> Maybe one day I just, I just might. <laughs> Man, bless the Lord. I got the right ones for sure. I, I ain't finna trip and fall off this stage no more. The Lord is blessing me. Yes, yes. Oh, man, it's a great time to be in the house of the Lord with you uh, this morning. Uh, my heart is heavy. Uh, I kind of shared with that a little bit in the first service. Um, there's a lot going on in our world. Our world is, is indeed infiltrated seemingly by evil. Um, we've got wars in Ukraine. We still got uneasiness in the Middle East, always has been, probably always will be. We've got violence in Buffalo, New York. Yes. Arbitrary people just killed for, for racial hatred. For what? You know, but God is all that we have. Yes. To calm our nerves and to calm our sense of being and to also encourages us to share the gospel with others. The change of the world comes through the church. And um, we've kind of missed out on some of our situations. Not that we particularly as a body of believers could have had an effect on Buffalo, New York, but we definitely can affect have an effect on the community that we are in. So in El Cajon, Lakeside, San Diego, um, La Mesa, we can have an effect. And each of those areas have had, over the past year and a half or so, some kind of retaliatory effect of destruction. You know, La Mesa, they burned up the, the bank. Anyway, I don't want to preach on that. There's a lot of other things that are going on, and what we really need is to, to be a true intercessor. Our prayer time for the month is to live, is living intercessory prayer theme. See, my mind is tripping. Intercessory prayer theme for the month is living by the Spirit. Our prayer text comes out of John 16, verse 7, and the word of the Lord reads, But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Our emphasis is really on praying for the people to call the counselor. To call upon the counselor for their needs and, and comfort. To pray for someone that you know that needs the help that only the Holy Spirit can give. Now, when you're praying for these people that you know that need the Spirit of God in them, you got to pray with faith to believe that God is going to respond to your prayer. Amen. If you don't pray with faith or in faith, it is not even worth praying. You got to believe. James tells us that we have to pray prayers of faith and believe in those prayers. So when I'm up here praying or you're praying at home, you have to believe. You have to have the faith to believe that not only can the Holy Spirit move and change and redirect and reconfigure situations, it can help you in your faith to believe that he can do that. And the Bible tells us that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. And that power that worketh within us is the Holy Spirit. And that takes you back to even when you don't see that he's working, even when you don't feel he's working, that's what happens. He never stops. 
God never stops working. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for the way within which you have brought us here today. We even thank you, Father, for waking us up today so that we can come together and, and be in this facility worshiping you, Father. We know that in all things that we do, Lord, you have an effect. You have an ordering of our steps. You take care of your children. You watch over us. You cover us, Father. You even help us in our mistakes, Father, because you say all things work. God works all things together for good. So, Father, we're just continuing to, to believe in you as I I've always said we continue to believe in your word and we just ask father for your blessings of favor to stay and rest upon us father we lift up those who are hurting that need the holy spirit working to comfort them we lift up those families out of buffalo new york who have have deceased loved ones who are never coming home father may have just ran out to the store for a quick uh, uh, bottle of milk or, or a, a cup of milk or, or sugar or whatever and then father they want wind up not going home. That's horrible. But Lord, there's simply evil in this world. And we know, Father, that you are indeed the only one that can combat this evil, Father. So we, as your children, are standing in the gap. We are interceding for those brothers and sisters who have lost their lives and their families thereof. We are praying, Father, for those who are held, uh, hold, uh, held uh, hostage in Milwaukee. We are talking, Lord, about even the, the, the Ukraine and, and uh, Russian war, and the issues in the Middle East. Father, you are the only one who can control these or help these situations. And even closer to home, Father, even our issues that we are having as a, a body of believers here uh, in El Cajon as we, we lift up and worship you, Father. We're asking you to touch every house that's represented in this facility, every house that is represented by those who are watching. And Father, just help us to get out of our comfort zone. Help us to get a little bit more focused on sharing the gospel and not so focused on, well, I'm not used to that. But Father, help us to be the children of God that you need us to be. Help us to walk out and share our lives with people, to be transparent, to be vulnerable, so that your spirit, Father, can reign and help the ones who need the greatest help, Father. And we just ask these things and just praying for each other. We're just asking you, Father, to, to bless those who are hurting this morning, who are, are not feeling well. Uh, Father, we are praying for Brother Michael and just asking, Lord, for your your uh, the touch of your healing embrace to be upon him, Father. Whatever the situation Mike is going through, or Big Mike is going through, we're asking you to bless him and to hold him, Father. And to make him make him better, Lord. We're praying for others who are just not feeling well this morning that may even be in the, the congregation sanctuary here, um, auditorium, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're just praying, Father, that your spirit would reign upon us, Father. Your spirit would give us strength, Father. And we would just be grateful uh, for you to do that, Father. We lift up the griefs, those who are grieving. Um, we know, Lord, we never get over grief. There's always a state of, wow, this really happened. You can't replace these people, Father, but your word says that you are the source of all comfort, that you will comfort us with a comfort that we can use to comfort others. So, Father, you are the one that helps us to endure. Time does not heal all wounds, but you help us to endure our grief. So, Father, continue to bless us and keep us, Father. We ask for a special and a fresh anointing over our pastor as he delivers the word to these, your people, as thus saith the Lord, Father. Again, Again, Father, we believe in your word and we believe that your word is true. And we're just going to ask, Father, that you would just keep him encouraged, keep him favored, keep him blessed so that the word will come forward, Father, from him, from you through him. And I just ask these things, Lord, because I know that you can change people. I know that you can make us better than we ever thought we could be. And I know, Father, that you can bring joy into our lives. So, Father, here we are. We pray that our worship has been true. And we pray, Father, that you would just continue to watch over and bless us, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Gary. 
leading us in our intercessory prayer time. This truly is a time where we're experiencing things that we had never imagined we would experience. And, uh, wow. So much going on. And this morning as we were, or actually I, I shared at the early service that uh, I was feeling a little off this week. And I was wondering what it was, what it was about, why. And then um, one of my nieces on social media reminded me of why. And uh, this past week we marked the home going of my brother. And uh, I, I miss being able to talk to him on the phone and, uh, you know, the, the advice, the sage advice he would give me. Um, you know, even the unsolicited sage advice. <laughs> Especially older brothers who decide to take the position of fathers and... I had to, uh, from time to time, remind him, you're not my father. <laughs> and then he would always tell me, well, I got kids your age. <laughs> <laughs> and we would we'd joke back and forth, but we, I, I do dearly miss him and well, I miss him, and as Pastor Gary said, we never get over grief, we just learn to deal with it. And then we press forward. Um, this morning, I want to share with you a message about, well, it's entitled, Setting Aside the Day. Keeping the Sabbath Holy. Today is a special day. And it's a day that we should keep holy. We really should. And the argument about the Sabbath rages. I mean, you know, this. some people feel the Sabbath was yesterday, Saturday, some today. And sadly, we get into this argument as believers, generally in the company of unbelievers, and we wonder why they want to be, why they don't want to be part of the church. Why would you want to be part of a group that argues all the time? They can't settle on a, on a day. That uh, you know what we. And I've said it, you've heard me say it last few weeks. We'll never argue people into the kingdom. Amen. The way people come into the kingdom is by our, our expression of love. Yes. Or by the love we express to them. We love people into the kingdom. Even people we disagree with. Or don't have the same mindset initially. As we love them, they'll want to know about this love that we are that we we are imparting to them, that we're sharing with them. And we know that love conquers a, a multitude of sins. But it's one of those lessons that we've, as the church, we've we're working on. We're still working on. Still working on loving folks. And this morning, as we look at the, the text, I want to remind us of the context that Nehemiah is, is the end of, we're really at the end of his, well, of his memoir, so to speak, of his memory of what has happened. And it's, as he's sharing, he's sharing, actually he's sharing with the people, but he's also sharing with God. And remember, they've been in exile. The, they've rebuilt, they've come out of exile, rebuilt the wall. They've celebrated that. 
He's gone back to be with the king, and then he comes back after a year and finds things, well, let me just put it this way. He finds things jacked up. Uh, they are not the way they were when he left after the choirs were singing and, and it was an exciting time. He, he comes back and he comes back to this, this mess, really. And he's trying to kind of make, uh, well, he, he wants to give them some final instructions or give them some instructions. And so this morning as we're sharing is I want to just it's um, and well, let me just put it to you this way. I I, I'm, I apologize. Um, you all are here, and the message I'm about to share is really for those who aren't here. And the reason I'm sharing it with you is because God's put it on my heart to share with you so that you will help me, and not me in particular, but help us as believers share the message with our brothers and sisters who aren't here. Amen. Amen. It's the proverbial preaching to the choir. So, I, I just want to give you the I'm trying to be nice and polite and tell you, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be offended. You're going to, you might even just be downright mad. That's okay. I'm just saying don't take it out on me. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But understand that what, we're, what, what I'm sharing, I'm sharing from, from my love for you, and my love for the Lord. As Pastor Gary said, we're, we're living in, in a time when war and racism and, and death, violence. But we're also living in a time when people have disrespected God. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. <clears throat> and again, forgive me if I'm saying this. We're old. I'm old school, and I just have reached. You know, I got enough gray hair now where I can reach. I've reached that point, or I can say I've reached that point where what God has placed inside of me is more important to to get out than to hold back. Amen. Amen. And so, if you so if you get if you're offended today. Pray about it. Amen. And then I'm going to encourage you, tell somebody about it. Not about how you're offended with me. <laughs> but how you're offended by, how you were offended by the message. Amen. 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 I, I, I hope I explained that. I'm going to look at the video later, and I'm sure I didn't do justice to what I was thinking in my head and what came out of my mouth. I'm working on I'm working on that that transition of stuff. But here in, in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 through 22, we're going to talk about this this. Let's well, let's read it. Let me just be quiet and read it. It says, in those days I saw men in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. Men from Tyre, who lived in Jerusalem, were bringing fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your forefathers do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity upon us and upon this city? 
Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my men on the, at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside of Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. When I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. And here's where he says to the Lord, he says, remember me for this also, O oh my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of this day. A day that we've never seen before and we'll never see again. We are here, Lord, in this place, in this space to worship you. To thank you for the privilege that we have to come into this place, to focus our, our mind and our hearts upon you and upon your word. Now I pray humbly, Father, that you would Allow me to be lowered deep into your word, to proclaim your word with boldness, with clarity, with understanding, so that we, your people, grasp your word. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, examine our lives and make the necessary adjustments in our lives to glorify you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for sitting now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Lord, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross, that you'd think with my mind and speak with my voice. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. For it is in your mighty and precious name I pray, with joy and thanksgiving and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Amen. As I said, the, the, the argument, the argument uh, about the Sabbath rages and it divides. But here, we're going to look at four things and a few subpoints. But the first thing we're going to look at is the, the situation. Verses 15 and 16 are, are, are really clear at the situation. The, the, basically, the, the situation there is a violation of the Sabbath. Two things have happened. There are two problems that, that really exist. The first is that the people were working and selling on the Sabbath day. First of all, that's what they were doing. Secondly, they were allowing foreigners to sell on that day. And all of this is a violation of God's command to keep the Sabbath holy. The Sabbath is all about honoring God. In fact, it's one of the commandments. If you look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse, verses 8 through 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within the gates, within your gates. <clears throat> For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. It's clearly that's a command from God. But it's to be kept, and it's, it's not only to be kept holy, but it's to be kept regardless of the time of year. 
In Exodus 34, he says, Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest, you must rest. They were not to work. Jeremiah 17, 21 through 23 tells us, this is what the Lord says, be careful not to carry, on, carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Do not bring your load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your forefathers. Yet they didn't listen to this. Yet they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff necked and would not listen or respond to discipline. And, and so not only are they supposed to do this, but he's reminding them, that at least Jeremiah reminded them, this is a standard. And you know that. But you're not listening, not understanding. And in fact, it, it applies not only to them, but it applies to their animals and to the non-Jews. In Deuteronomy 5, it says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant, your maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates so that your manservant and your maidservant may rest as you do. So that's the problem. The problem has its two parts that they're violating the Sabbath and everything, they're letting everybody else do it around them. And so what does he do? What, is, what does Nehemiah do? He confronts them. Look at verses 17 and 18 with me. First he confronts the nobles of Judah. The, the upper crust, if you will, the, the influential people. And, and we already know he's got a, they don't have a good relationship. The, Nehemiah and the nobles don't have a good relationship. He, he, first of all, he tells, you, he tells us back in chapter 3, these are some lazy dudes. Excuse my casualness, but the, they were lazy. And not only were they lazy, but they also, on the other side of that, they had caused trouble because they were loan sharks. They loaned money and, and they charged a usury for it. And they were, taking, they were abusing the people. And then not only were they lazy loan sharks, but then they compromised with Tobiah. So obviously he doesn't have a good relationship with these guys. And he confronts them though. And he says to them, his message to them is, didn't you learn from history? You know, if we forget our history, what, what happens? You guys know that, that old saying, we're bound to repeat it. Yes. Yes. Well, here's what they did. That's what they did. And he says, didn't your forefathers do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity upon us and upon this city? They've literally rebuilt Jerusalem because they had... They had brought calamity by their, their actions and their behavior, and they had brought the wrath of God upon them. They went into exile. They come out. They rebuild everything, and they celebrate. He goes away from me for a year. He comes back, and he finds them doing the same thing they were doing before. So I, I'm, I'm sure as the, the leader that he was, I'm sure he's upset. He says, now you're stirring up, you're stirring up more wrath against us because you're, you're desecrating the Sabbath. So don't, don't you know that God's going to judge as he did, did before? He's going to do it again. And don't you understand that what you have done is, is you've defiled, you've polluted, you desecrated the holy day by your actions. And yet they bring wrath upon Israel by their action, by profaning the Sabbath. So Nehemiah offers a prescription. You know, like any good leader, he's got a, 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 I won't say a solution, but he's got a prescription of what they can do, what they can put in place to make things correct. 
First thing he does is he closes the doors. Look what it says there in verse 19. It says, when evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. Close the doors. And I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. And I think there's, a, there's even a funny video about somebody wanting some of that sweet tea that they have at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> there's a whole music video about that. You can't get that on, on the Sabbath. They're closed. <laughs> And, and I know some of, your, some of you are crafters and you like to get things probably from Hobby Lobby and you go there on Sunday. They're closed. <laughs> They're not doing any trading on Sunday. That's right. There's no sweet tea available at Chick-fil-A on Sunday. Right. <laughs> but yet these are two of the largest restaurants, fast food restaurants and retailers in America. Yeah. Hello. They must be doing something right. I'm just, just an observation. <laughs> Praise God and protect the first responders that are going by. But the gates were shut. There's no access to the marketplace, to the temple. And they remained closed till the next day. And there was no exceptions. And the, the gates... On top of that, were they had guards to ensure that they remained closed. Look at what it says. Not only is it, did he order them closed on the Sabbath, but he says, I stationed some of my men on the gate so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath. Now, we know, we know his men. If you, if you remember the history of his men, when, when the walls were being rebuilt... His men, they had a trowel in one hand and a weapon in the other. These are some bad dudes. They could, they could be fixing and cut you up at the same time. And he said, this is who he put on the, on the walls to, or the, over the gates to guard them to make sure they stayed closed. And, and then he warned them. Well, not, I, before I, I, I get that, I, I want to make sure you, you, you catch what he, he says. It, it's so, he's so polite when he says, you know, that he, he warned them and then he let them know that if, if they violate this, he's, he said so polite. He says, I will lay hands on you. <laughs> I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm, I'm, in other words, I'm going to take a, Nike, a, a Mike Tyson punch at your head. <laughs> you know, I, you remember Iron Mike, you know, at, the, at his heyday, you, you knew that his fight was going, if it lasted three rounds, it was long. Because he's going to hit them and knock them cold. And, and that's what, that, essentially that's what Nehemiah is saying. I, I, I know that's not what he's saying, but graphically, I mean, he's making it clear. That he warned them. And then it says, once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside of Jerusalem. They tried to get around, in other words, uh, the order of trading by hanging out outside the wall. But he warned them. He told them, no, that's not going to happen. And he wants them, he warns them to make them, well, to, to comply. He, he has essentially said to them, you know, that he's going to, He's going to arrest them, and, but his comment to them, when he says he's going to lay hands on them, scared them off. And I know some of us remember there, there used to be a, a, a little documentary called Scared Straight. <laughs> he scared these, these guys straight, right? But God's service, hear me clearly, God's service requires purity, the Old Testament tells us in Isaiah 51 or 52, 11, it says, depart, depart and go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure. For it and be pure. You will carry the you who carry the vessels of the Lord. This was a, a, a ceremonial, a ceremonial cleansing that was both physical and spiritual. 
And, and, and it applies today. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Therefore, come out from them and be separate. This week I was reading an article. It was talking about, you know, that people have, are, are having problems and, or that churches are having problems with Sunday morning attendance because of youth sports. They're saying, you know, youth sports is just taking up families Sunday time and they can't come to they can't come to church or they can't go to church because, you know, Johnny's playing travel baseball. Well, I, I want to just let you know, and, and this is I know this is another sermon another day, so I'm not going to I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. But the San Diego Padres are not investing any money in scouting 10 year olds. <laughs> Promise you. Amen. That's not what they do. That, that's not how they make millions and billions of dollars in Major League Baseball by scouting 10 year olds. They don't do that. So anybody who tells you that, the, well, we've got to take Johnny because Johnny's got to play in this tournament. You need to invest. You need to take Johnny's little and bring him to church. Amen. Johnny doesn't need. It's another sermon. It's not another sermon on another day. But, but you, you hear what I'm saying. Okay. And. It's, it's so important that we understand this. It, secondly, and, and it applies to us, is when Paul says to the church at Corinth that since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body, physical and, and spirit, the spiritual part, of it, and perfecting holiness out of reverence for God, out of Fear or out of, and then maybe if you, if fear is too uncomfortable for you, out of respect for God. We talk about, you hear people quote, train up the child. Well, if we compromise and we don't bring the child to come to worship and to come to participate in spiritual activities, we have, what are we doing? What are we expecting of our children when they grow up? Or our grandchildren. We have to be training them up. You train them. They get an idea. And, and I, I can tell you from my own personal experience, my own personal life, I, I remember when I made the profession of faith and, and decided that, that I wasn't going to go to to finish at the University of San Diego because of the theology of the school. And I told my dad. I had to go tell him. And, and he told me, well, we weren't Catholic. I said, wait, well, hold up, wait a minute. After going through parochial school through eighth grade and then making a deal to go to college, and then he's going to tell me that we're not Catholic. And he said to me, he says, well, did you ever see me go to, go to the Catholic church? And what I really wanted to say, but out of fear and reverence for him, I didn't say what I was thinking, because I was thinking... I ain't never seen you go to church. Oh. <laughs> but I, I didn't say that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. I'm, I'm telling you, J.D. Slade would have took me out. <laughs> but when I gave my life to the Lord and went into ministry and, and invited him to come to church, he came Sunday after Sunday and we were able to my brother and I were able to stand in the baptistry and baptize him as a believer. And then he told the story of how he came to be where he was in life. Because somebody in the family back down south had said he was going to be the next preacher and he ran from that. He went into the Navy. He got a young lady pregnant. He went into the Navy. He, he traveled the world trying to get away from them. Then he ends up with two sons being preachers. <laughs> kind of like, oh wow! But we we have to do what we, the, the necessary things to to not contaminate the body, to not contaminate the the, the spirit, and to perfect our whole. We've got to we ought to be living a holy life. So, my brothers and sisters, as I said before, we can't sit on the fence, and so there's an application here. And there's more than one part of this application. First of all, our worship together has, pr 
precedent. Precedent meaning that it's been done before and it's been recognized to be beneficial to those who participated in it in the past. The example that I'm going to share with you this morning is that the early church met on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in the place. Yeah. Now, say what you want to say about the New Testament church, but they were all together in the place on the right day. When the Holy Spirit showed up, they were in the house. Amen. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm about to get country, I know. I can, I can feel it coming, I can feel the sweat rolling down my back. I'm trying, but anyway, here we go. I need, we, we need to make sure, I want to make sure that you're clear about this. So Pentecost means 50th. And it's the, the New Testament name for the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest, which was celebrated 50 days after Passover. And so in post-exile Judaism, it's also celebrated, it also celebrated the giving of the law to Moses. And the Spirit's coming on that day was linked to the pattern of the feast in the Old Testament. So if we were to look at Leviticus chapter 23, we'd see the timetable, that the first, first great feast that we've, that's mentioned in that chapter is the Feast of Passover, the killing of the Passover lamb, which is a picture, if you will, of the death of Jesus Christ, the ultimate Passover lamb. Amen. The second feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrated on the day after Passover. And during that feast, an offering of first fruits of, gra of the grain harvest was made. And in fact, Leviticus 23.15 commands that offering to be made on the day after the Sabbath day. And here, here's where we, we kind of get some variants and, and where I think some of this idea of, or the argument comes of, of believers arguing which day is the Sabbath day. Because the Sadducees and the Pharisees they differed on what the Sabbath was. See, the Sadducees interpreted it as, as a weekly Sabbath. And therefore, the, the grain offering would always be on Sunday. But the Pharisees, they interpreted the Sabbath as the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so according to that interpretation... The grain offering would always fall on the same day of the month, but not on the same week. Or the same day of the week. And it was, until, it was up until the destruction of the temple in AD 70 that the Sadducees' interpretation was the normative, the normal interpretation from Judaism. Therefore, the day of first fruits were, were offered or would be offered on Sunday. And so that provides the basis, if you will, for our understanding that the Lord Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of those who are asleep, from 1 Corinthians 15, 20, that 50 days after the first Sunday following Passover, the Feast of Pentecost was celebrated. So at Pentecost, an, and another offering of the first fruits was made, now we're in Leviticus, really, in, in verse 20, 20 in Leviticus 23, if we're following along. And we complete the cycle that of fulfillment of the feast, and the Spirit came on Pentecost as the first fruits for believers and our inheritance. So that's why, the, again, the, the, there's, a, there's a precedent that is set in us worshiping together in this place. But not only is there a, a precedent, but there's also a, a purpose. On the first day, Acts 20, 17, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread, and Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, they kept talking, or he kept on talking until midnight. 
It's, so, it's, it's a day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. He rose on Sunday. But also our worship has meaning. We're not just coming together because this, this is not a social event. This is a time of corporate worship. It's a time for us to, to deepen our spiritual life. It's a time for us to draw strength from the word of God, from the presence of our fellow believers, of singing songs, of rejoicing, of, of looking to God. It's a time that we kind of fill up, if you will. It's a time of preaching. It's a time of prayer. It's a, type of, it's a time of participating. It's a time of preparing us for the week to come. That's a time for us to support one another. That's what happens here. But our worship together is also healthy. It's beneficial. So that the Holy Spirit can work on our hearts. And, you know, when it's properly done, when it's properly done, when our worship is properly done, Christ is present. He himself said in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Yes. So there's some, there's some benefits to us coming together. It also will help to prevent us from being deceived by the evil one. The author of Hebrews, I, I, I believe it's, it was Paul, but I know there's other interpretations, but we're not here to argue interpretations, remember. But it says in, in Hebrews 3.13, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceptiveness. It you know, if we, if we miss out, and, and I think... Uh, I, I have a quote here from J.G. Butler who wrote the analytical Bible expository or expositor's comment. He writes this. He says, it promotes spiritual devotion. Coming to church, it promotes spiritual devotion or coming to worship. The decline and departure from the rest and spiritual emphasis on Sunday will always evidence a decline in spiritual devotion. In other words, we pull away, if we pull away from spiritual devotion, it's not surprising that our life will become chaotic. That our life will deteriorate because we are, we are deteriorating spiritually. We need to be plugged in. We need to come together. Because when we come together, it produces accountability. Others see us in worship and we see others. We know that they're here, and we, and we draw strength from each other, from the experiences that we have, and from the experiences that we share. And when people miss, and they're not here, then they don't have to deal with being held accountable. It's easy. You know, you, just, you, can, you can rationalize and come up with any old excuse. And, and, and we do. But, but here's what happens. We can create those ex excuses, but the conviction of the Holy Spirit brings a deeper accountability than we can as human beings. Our worship together is, is an act of obedience. It's commanded. Especially, it says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. I, I don't want to be, well, maybe it's, it's going to be a surprise to you. I, I hope it's not. We're one day closer to the Lord coming, yeah. returning. I, I hope you realize that. We're one more day closer. Whatever happened yesterday, that's gone. We are today, and we're a day closer than we were yesterday. So the day is approaching. So if the day is approaching of what he's telling us in Hebrews, we ought to be encouraging each other to come together, be here. It's because it's, it's necessary for us to gain strength, to build us up. I, I, I remember as I was preparing, I was thinking about this 
Well, there was a thing that happened. I, I've told you about the choir coming to get in the in at the Bayview Church with the robes and and the, and the drum going and, and kind of stepping down the aisle and how beautiful that was. But when the choir got into the choir stand, this is what they would say. They, before they, they sang any song, they would say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So with take a moment. Wisdom with as to with contemplate in your heart. And hymns and spiritual and songs. And notice I'm saying that to contemplate in, your, in heart, your heart. Not in your mind or in your God. head. But in your heart. They'd say that and then they, then they would begin. So it was like, how is your spiritual this? condition? A preparation. They were doing this to encourage us. And if you're no, not I there, was, if you're, if you're not participating, service, there's this, you don't get a chance to do that. little gizmo now that you can, you can so here, here's, download here's the, the app on your the phone. The theme of today. And buy a little and plastic card that has two little... Man, it took him 45 kind of, minutes to get to the theme. I guess ships in it. And you can put it on a table and you can hit the app on your what phone. And you can take your two index fingers and put it on the two little chips to on you. that little plastic card. It's the size of a credit card. And it will give you mean an to EKG. You? How do you approach this day of worship? Now, I'm just, I mean, do you, do you prepare I'm gonna date myself when for full, my to, first to really EKG be present, in to be a part, or an all-out participation? They give them, there was a tough time, time, or, or or a time when they couldn't do hearted and EKGs just, in the doctor's you know, office. You had to go to the hospital because it's, it you know, it's going to take too long. That's, I got that's, stuff to go do. So it was when I was a child. <laughs> See, how we approach but now Sunday we've made worship. it so easy. You can take your EKG Speaks to the literally spirit, on spiritual a credit card condition condition at the kitchen table of our lives. And what I'm asking you today is contemplate. See, if you know Jesus your as your Lord and Savior, with how you treat the Sabbath will be different. Where's your EKG? How you treat any other EKG? It's really. You've heard really me say. Simple. Have you? I don't know how many times your heart condition. You didn't just decide. Last night that you were going to come here today, I want I want to be encouraging to you today. And, and, and as I Usually said, the decisions made. In the introduction, I know I'm preaching to the I don't choir. Know, might be made on Tuesday. Might be made well, on Wednesday. Sisters, we have friends, we have family members. But it should have been made last Sunday. Who profess to be believers. Who I'm are be not there. here. Was, this is what I do. And, and I'm not just saying because this is the day set aside here to honor him, him to honor but they're not at God, church not to honor you, not to honor me, or not to but honor any other human being. But it's a day I'm set aside to Lord. honor. You know, God. I'm with the Lord. But will ever come into the door. We've got to keep it holy and come together to worship. But the only way you can keep it I hope holy I'm giving you the is to know the Holy One. We need to be here. We need to show Can't up. Can't do it on your own. And participate. I promise you, there's going to be stuff come up Not on your show calendar. Not to show up and Somebody say, well, ask you to do you know, something. I'll say amen that you don't need if to he doing. moves me. Or if the worship team sings the right song, I'll, I might applaud. It, it, it's got nothing to do with them. The, what I'm talking about is where are, is your heart. And are you prepared before you come in? Because what you add to this experience will make the experience full for all of us. But you got to know the Holy One. Let's pray together. Lord, as we pray about where we are, I pray, Father, that we will acknowledge, acknowledge what we need to do in our lives. Acknowledge that we are sinners. Who believe that you came, Lord Jesus, to earth, that you died on the cross at Calvary, and we confess you as Lord and Savior. And we make the commitment to follow you as disciples, to be disciplined followers. Lord, I pray today that in this place, whether it's in this place or online, that we'll examine our hearts, acknowledge our heart condition. And Lord, I pray we give our lives to you. Simply, Lord, 
and the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to respond to the urgency of setting aside this day and doing whatever we have to do to keep the Sabbath holy. For we do it not for ourselves, but to honor you and what you have done for us to give us a hope and a future. You, Lord Jesus, are our living hope. So we ask you to have your way in this place, in these moments. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Charlene, before we, before we take the offering, would you put that chorus, that last chorus up? Right back up. I just want to. I just want to let you all know. I do want to just share this with you. I have, and the worship team, you all don't know this. I've been singing this song all week, <laughs> all week. And I want to let you know this. This course right here. This will change your blood pressure. <laughs> When, somebody, when somebody's getting all over you and he's getting you all upset, just say, all my life you have been faithful. God, I don't know what's going on, but you've been faithful. So I know you're in control of this and however you're working this out. Yes. You've been faithful. I trust you. And so all my life you've been so, so good to me. I have this day. I'm dealing with this knucklehead, but I have this day. <laughs> Yes. Somebody didn't get up today. I did. Yes. And so I get it. You've been faithful. You're fixing it. You're, I don't know how you're going to work it because everything works together for good. Right. For those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Right. So if I'm yours, because all my life you have been faithful, it makes sense. All my life you've been so, so good to me with every breath that I'm, at, I'm able. Because right. somebody ain't breathing today. Amen. With every breath, I will sing of the goodness Amen. of God. Amen. I'm, I'm just, just as a parenthetical note. Amen? Amen. That's, that's another sermon. That's, nah, that's a parenthetical note. That ain't even a sermon on another day. We ought to be living that every day. So I, I know that our